Shall we pray? Father, just thank you for reminding us that you are with us this morning because we sense your presence here in the company of our scouts and other families. And we pray right now, Lord, that you will speak to us as we consider the words that James has just read, that you would give us some insight into your truth. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord and our God and our Redeemer. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Mary and Joseph are shocked when they find out that the 12-year-old Jesus is not with them, the group of caravans returning to Nazareth. Where is Jesus? is their cry. And Mary, Joseph, and Jesus have gone up to Jerusalem to celebrate the festival of the Passover. And the, the, the trip takes around a, a two days to get from Nazareth to Jerusalem and then from Jerusalem to Nazareth back. And for your information, Passover is a time when the people of Israel get together to celebrate uh, their liberation from slavery in, um, in Egypt. So, Mary and Joseph experience a horror that parents do not wish they experience. Their 12-year-old boy, Jesus, is not with them in the caravan party as they are midway through the journey. And I can imagine Mary and Joseph saying to themselves, I thought we asked Jesus to tell us if he's going to a particular place. To let us know if, he is going, uh, if he's going to move to a particular place. Uh, and after a day in this journey, they start calling for Jesus and he cannot be found. Where is Jesus? Where is our son? So Mary and Joseph go back to Jerusalem and they spend three days looking for Jesus. So this tells us how big Jerusalem is. Um, and then they find him. They find Jesus uh, in the temple, uh, the place where you would not uh, expect a 12-year-old boy to be in. And not only do they find Jesus in the temple, he is talking to the teachers of the temple and uh, hearing from them and asking them questions. And when Mary and Joseph find Jesus with the teachers, the teachers at the temple tell uh, Mary and Joseph they are amazed as to how much he knows about the Old Testament and they are amazed at the questions he asks of uh, the, the teachers in the temple. So, if you do your math, um, he's been three days in the temple, and that one day uh, where Mary and Joseph are halfway through their trip in Nazareth, and they find that Jesus is missing, so they come back. So Jesus has spent four days in Jerusalem talking to the temple teachers. And as I read this when I was around your age, I've always, always asked this. When Jesus was in Jerusalem at the temple talking with the teachers for four days, where did he sleep? Who put him up? Uh, did he become a scout and pitch a tent in the middle of the Jerusalem courtyard? Did he do that? Um, or did he just keep on talking with the temple teachers for four days? Or did one of the temple teachers get Jesus to go home with them? We don't know. We don't know. But I just tell you that when you read the Bible, you actually have a lot of questions. And it's okay to ask these kind of questions. Whether you get the answers is another matter, but ask those questions. So after they find Jesus uh, in the temple with these teachers, uh, there is an inter interesting conversation that occurs between Jesus and his parents. And, and, and let's look at it. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Uh, this actually reminds me of the conversations I had with my children too. Why were you searching for me? He asked. 
Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. So firstly, when we look at this passage, and it's very clear from this passage, uh, that there is actually tension between Jesus and his parents. Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And so as I read this passage when I was your age, I've always wondered, how can nice Jesus be so rude to his parents? Okay, Because you can see that there's tension between uh, his parents and himself. And then, as I got older, and when I became a parent myself, I can see that this tension between Jesus and his parents, in some ways, is like the tension we all have when we become parents. And I believe that the Bible is a very human book because it exposes us to normalcy, to human uh, relationship, as we said. And, and as you put two, put two people in the room, and conflict is bound to happen. And so we have a picture here for ourselves of, if you like, the tension of bringing up a 12-year-old child when, you're the, when you are his parent. And you can't run away from conflict. And when you look at Mary and Joseph and Jesus, you can't run away from conflict in your life too. Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? So notice the mention of the two fathers here. First of all, there's the mention of Joseph. Your father and I have been searching for you. And then there is this mention of him being in his father's house, which is the temple. So the question we have here is, did Jesus have two fathers? We have just celebrated Christmas. And as we all know, at Christmas, we celebrate that Jesus is born as the Son of God. The Son of God. That means Jesus has God as his Father. So, therefore, Joseph is not Jesus' real Father, but God is. And Joseph adopted Jesus into the family of Mary of him, and himself. Or should I say, if Jesus is the Son of God, that the Son of God, Jesus, adopted Joseph to be his earthly father. So, what are we... Now, this term, Son of God, is a very difficult term to understand. What does it mean? I believe all it means is that as the Son of God, Jesus is God as a human being. I repeat, as the Son of God, Jesus is God as a human being. So God decides to come down to earth to save us human beings. And so he does so as Jesus, the Son of God, God as a human being. And so he becomes a human being in a person named Jesus, and his main mission is to save us. Now, after this episode, the author of this particular part of the Bible, Luke, uh, tells us something about what happened after that. And I'm going to get all of us to read Luke 51 and 52 because these are the key punch verses we're going to look at this morning. So let's read together Luke 2, 51 to 52. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So the author of this particular passage, Luke, wants to make sure that we don't get the idea that Jesus is a rebellious teenager after this episode. So he makes this statement. He went back to Jerusalem and was obedient to his parents. And that his mother treasured all these things that occurred to Jesus in her heart. So therefore, Luke is trying to say, you might get this idea that between, of, about this tension of Jesus that he might become this rebellious teenager not wanting to listen to his parents. No. Instead, uh, Luke is trying to clarify here that after this episode, he went back to Nazareth and he became obedient 
to his parents, and his mother treasured all these things that occurred um, in, in his life. Then we come to this key verse, which is the verse I want to focus in this morning. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, in favor with God and people. Now, here we see four areas of life Jesus grew up in. Uh, because if he's the son of God and he spent time in the temple with the teachers, and if he, if, if he is this religious person, wouldn't you think that the rest of his life should be spent in the temple with the teachers growing up? But instead, what does Jesus do? He becomes an ordinary human being and he probably became an apprentice carpenter to his father. And Luke tells us that he goes back and when he goes back, he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and people. And I love this verse because when I was 15 years old, I went to a particular Christian club and there was this leader who told me about the four areas of life. Uh, Jesus grew up in, and I've cherished this uh, four areas of life since I was your age, and I've hold, held these four areas as kind of things that I should uh, think about when I want to live life in a balance and in a totality. And I've shared these four areas of life uh, with my children too, and I call it the balanced life. And Jesus grew in wisdom which is the mental aspect of life, and stature, which is the physical aspect of life, in favor with God, which is the spiritual aspect of life, and people, which is the social aspect of life. And uh, around uh, two Wednesdays ago, I came and uh, visited the, the Venturers, and we were talking about my proposed uh, message today, and the venture leaders told us that when you look into the scouting uh, books, you find that there are areas of life too in which the scouts would like to be involved with. And so when I proposed that I was going to share this with them, they told me that it was somewhat similar to the scouting uh, approach to life. And so therefore, uh, there are these things that we find in common between the Bible and the scouting handbook, if you like, that I want us to grab hold of uh, today. And it's so important to realize that Jesus lived a balanced life, that he didn't spend the rest of his life in the Jerusalem temple, but he went home and became an ordinary carpenter's son and probably learned the trade of being a carpenter, and he grew up in wisdom, which is the mental aspect of life, and he grew up in stature, which is the physical aspect of life, and he grew in favor with God, which is the spiritual aspect of life, and he grew up in favor with people, which is the social aspect of life. And so grab hold of this, and if you forget about this, remember it's Luke 2.52. And when you read up Luke 2.52 in the Bible, you will be reminded of these four areas of life. The mental, the physical, the spiritual, and the social. And it is my prayer as scouts, actually it is my prayer as all of you people, that you grow up, quote unquote, or advance in life in these four areas of your life, that you, you experience the balanced life in its fullness when you pay attention to the mental, the physical, the spiritual, and the social aspect of life. So we're going to close in prayer right now and we're going to move into the rest of the service. Thank you for these words, Lord, and we pray that we will all take these words home with us, that you call us to be involved in the fullness of life, uh, in the mental, in the physical, in the spiritual, um, and in the social. And we pray, Lord, that we would discover life in its fullness as we practice these four areas. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.